Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think it's not six o'clock yet, so it's not evening, correct? <laughs> Commissioners, I have brought some honored employees to this meeting tonight because I really want to show you the effects of the support that you have put forth for mobile integrated community health. And with me tonight is Captain Jared Smith, who is the program administrator for mobile integrated community health. <coughs> Melanie Chapel, our dentist from University pharmacist, of Maryland. Pharmacist. Or pharmacist, rather, <laughs> I'm sorry. You gave me such a smile on the see his teeth. I saved that. <laughs> so, Melanie is our pharmacist from the University of Maryland Shore Regional Health, and she is on all of our telemedicine and PharmD consults. Amy Crook is one of our health department nurses, and she is one of our community health nurses. And tonight, I would like the team to speak to you and to the citizens of Queen Anne County for the progress that we have made. This is our eighth year. August of this year will be nine years. We started the pilot in the state of Maryland. There are multiple other jurisdictions now following this program and this policy, and we're also starting to be recognized nationally for what we are doing. So with your support, Jared, take the ball. Uh, 2012, Dr. Ciatola corralled uh, a number of different multi-disciplinary uh, agencies with the intent to um, come up with a goal or come up with a plan to address uh, patients in the community who were exhibiting unmet needs. The population within our county is ever-growing. We have numerous additions to senior living. Um, with more senior, senior patients coming into the county, we know that health care needs within our county are also increasing. Why do we need a program like the Mobile Integrated Community Health Program? Despite having the most expensive health care system, the United States ranks last overall compared with other industrialized countries on measures of quality, efficiency, access to care, equity, and the ability to lead long, healthy, and productive lives. How did we get here? Lack of access to convenient care, uh, limited appointment availability for, for folks within the communities, transportation barriers, patients don't have a way to get to their appointments, limited knowledge of available resources. There are numerous resources out there that patients can utilize, but they have no idea they exist. High healthcare costs. We all know that healthcare costs are, are repeatedly growing or consistently growing. Uh, I think in 2011, uh, the average health care spending per person in the United States was $8,500. So for a lot of people, that would be crippling. Health care staff shortages. Uh, we all know, especially once COVID hit, we lost a lot of our nursing staff in, in hospitals, and that's caused for a lot of issues with, within our hospital system. And geographic barriers, uh, which, which includes phys physician shortages um, and a greater number of uninsured, longer distances for patients to travel, which they may have difficulty doing. A study by the National Academy of Medicine found that medical care itself only accounts for 10 to 20 percent of the contributors to people's health outcomes. And by contrast, the many social determinants of health play a much, much bigger role in 80 to 90 percent of the contributing factors. Now, the thing with this is that the 10 to 20 percent can be dealt with in the hospital, but once the patient gets home, they don't have a way to, to have those, those needs met. So that's where we come in. We come in to address the 80 to 90 percent. Now, some of the social determinants of health, uh, access to primary health care, health insurance coverage, economic stability, education, social and community life, um, and neighborhoods, quality of housing, access to clean water and air, etc. One thing to note is that Queen Anne's County is technically considered a medical desert, uh, which means that we are one of only three counties in the state of Maryland without a definitive care hospital. I thought that we were only one out of 
two counties. Dorchester, Dorchester is now Dorchester is now yeah. closed and is That's essentially right. a freestanding ED with a medical office right. building in Caroline and us. Right. Thank you. Even Garrett County has a hospital. Yeah, they do. We have one freestanding emergency department within the county. It's an actual term. And which is the only place that patients can go for really any after hour care. The partnerships that it took to put this program together, we have Department of Emergency Services, Department of Health, MIMS, which is the EMS state agency, UMS Shore Regional Health, our county commissioners, Addictions and Prevention Services, Area Agency on Aging, and Luminous Health. And while we're on Luminous Health, behind me sit the nurses of the transition team from Luminous Health. Sarah. Brace is the leader of the transition team, and they are the responsible unit that helps with discharge of patients. And the fact that Anne Arundel Medical Center is the highest number of patients that we transport into their ER, they are number one for Queen Anne County for mm -hmm. EMS. Our program is funded by, uh, we receive funding from Luminous Health and I'm sure regional health. We receive funding from our county commissioners, from the health department, and then the majority of our funding does come from grants. Our team consists of uh, a number of different uh, people with different roles within healthcare, each one coming with their own unique uh, knowledge and skill set. And uh, when brought together, they really complement each other uh, in order to give the patient the most comprehensive home visit that, that we can do. We have uh, Department of Health nurses, our Queens County paramedics, Melanie, our hospital-based pharmacist, and if, if we have a patient with substance abuse issues, uh, we will take a peer recovery specialist to our home visit as well. And then we have Dr. Ciatola, who has oversight of both the health department and emergency medical services. He's telling me that guy in the back is standing on a box. No. <laughs> The way, our, the way our home visits work, uh, the paramedics, they will take on the physical examination, uh, they'll take vital signs, they'll hook the patient up to the cardiac monitor, they'll do an EKG, they can test for hemoglobin A1C, which is a good indicator of diabetes or prediabetes. They will do a home safety assessment, uh, they utilize the PEAT scale, which is the physical um, uh, assessments, the physical environment assessment tool. Um, they check for fire safety issues, uh, fall risk assessment, and if need be, we will install safety devices um, within the home. Our nurses, they review the past medical history and medication inventory for the patients. Uh, they do a diabetes risk assessment. They'll start the telehealth consult with Melanie, and then they'll tackle the social determinants that we talked about earlier. They'll, they'll do an assessment of patient education and their support system to try to find out what issues are occurring that are causing the patients to fall through the healthcare cracks. At the end of the visit, uh, the team collaborates and they talk with the patient and they determine what referrals would benefit the patient and what ways they can get the patient uh, to have their needs met. And it's important to note that there is no cost to the patient for the, for the mixed program. The health and home safety, again, we do a fall risk assessment a physical environment assessment tool, and then we do something called the Euroqual, which um, measures the patient's view of their own quality of life. When COVID hit, we, we stopped doing uh, home visits for safety reasons, but we were able to use the expertise of our staff and their unique skills and knowledge there too, to pivot and tackle the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. We, did, we first staffed one of the first drive-up COVID test sites in the state, um, starting on March 20th. We partnered with Luminous Health to install remote patient monitors for COVID positive and suspected positive patients. And we vaccinated assistant living, senior housing, and congregate living facilities, as well as bed-bound individuals. So we were taking the vaccines to patients who couldn't go out to these clinics to get the vaccines. And that was a total of uh, 1,200 vaccines to date. That's me. 
Um, my name is Melanie Chapel. I am a pharmacist at University of Maryland Shore Regional Health. I've been part of the MIC team t since 2016. I told Dr. Siotola very early on that I would go on a lecture circuit for him to advocate for this program. I sit in a very unique position at the hospital in that I see all the counties. So Shore Health serves Talbot, Caroline, Dorchester, Kent, and Queen Anne's County. And I wish every other, all those counties had this program. I see the value every day in what we do for these patients, and I just wish um, it was at every other county. So I actually get the ability to, um, from the comfort of my own office in the hospital, while the team is there to talk to patients through our um, telehealth pl platform called Backline. And my process starts by getting the med inventory from the team members, and then I can individually go through um, the medications with the patient. Um, I can assess for barriers. Um, for me, um, one of the things that I personally that has come from this is I feel I've become a better pharmacist because it's not just knowing about how medications work in a patient's body, but the barriers that exist for people to take medications correctly. And it could be education, it could be access to, to the medications, costs, those things. So I may be able, able to assess um, these patients, um, you know, anything that can, can prevent a patient from taking medication correctly. So we navigate in real time while the patient is and the team is there, we will sometimes navigate with their personal, personal um, primary care providers to navigate problems that patients are have. So it's a really real time, wonderful program to kind of fix problems right while the team is there. And we have so many, so many, so many success stories. And sometimes it's shocking to me. Um, you know, you, you think, you know, the hospital, you know, patients go into a hospital, you know, wanting to improve their health status, but there still exist multiple things when patients get home. And we really have been able to be in a unique position, even comparatively to home health home healthcare companies, in my opinion, to kind of navigate real world issues. So we have some success stories. I think the next slide shows some of those. Um, oh. It's the next one, I think. Some of those next stories, just as a point of reference, these are not real patient pictures on this on this slide. But I just want to kind of highlight some really interesting ones that I see, and these are just not, these are, we've seen multiple examples of these, but what, the first patient um, highlighted here is a patient we saw, a 75-year-old woman who had multiple hospitalizations, who had come in for falls. Um, she was complaining of weakness. And when the team got in there, they determined that she'd been taking three of the same class of medications that lower somebody's blood pressure and pulse rate. So she was taking something incorrectly for a long period of time. We were able to go in there and navigate and reconcile the medication list and make sure that she was taking the appropriate medications. So there's, it was, it was, an, it was a tremendous success story because her pulse was dropping and she was falling. And by taking those medications that she shouldn't have been taking out of her arsenal, we avoided you know, having future problems for her. The next patient was a patient who had um, low literacy. He couldn't, he couldn't read, so it was very difficult for him to navigate his COPD, COPD medications, nebulized medicines. And so it was really a unique process. We kind of tailored an um, educational system with pillboxes and charts and color coding things to make sure this patient could take his medications appropriately. So we had a unique system put in place to make sure this patient was um, in, you know, making sure he's taking his medications correctly. The other um, team, the last patient that I want to talk about is something that to me, this happened early on. I, I've been in, in this program since 2016, and this to me is, for me as a pharmacist, changed my whole view about how I interact with patients. This patient had multiple ER visits for um, low blood sugar. And I was thinking when the team got in there, I was going to go be educating this patient on insulin, on how to eat, what foods to eat. And really what we determined is this patient was not looking at her insulin, she was not drawing up her insulin correctly because she couldn't see very well. So the team was able to work with the local Lions Club and get this patient a new set of glasses. And guess what stopped? The ER visits. Mm. So for me, like I said, insulin is gonna help somebody manage their diabetes, but if they're not taken correctly, you can really have a whole host of errors with that. So. I really do feel this program is invaluable. Um, it's, it's, in, in the pharmacy world, it is 
very unique and it's just uh, what is what services it's providing the community is amazing awesome if you have a can i ask a question uh, if you have a patient who's on you find out that they're on a cocktail so to speak can you change that or do you have to go back to the the referring physician and and, uh, so another another example is we've had people so another example that I remember very early on there was a patient that got came into the hospital and she was on 80 milligrams of lisinopril which is a medication for blood pressure when she got discharged she was only supposed to be on 2.5 milligrams and so when the team got in there she continued to take the 80 milligrams so that's whopper of a dose. So what ended up happening that for that patient, we called the primary care doc, um, office right in that moment and got her appointment immediately, and she was seen, and a, her, that medication was addressed. So you're regulating her meds. That's, yep. That's great. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so I'm going to share three more success stories. Uh, the first one is a 68-year-old woman living in unsafe home conditions. She was also found to be without a primary care provider, and she did not have a landline phone or a mobile phone. She did not have an adequate income to buy proper groceries, so the McTeam referred her to a primary care provider, provided her with free government phone, and helped her get access to food stamps. Um, so I feel like this patient and her needs and the services that we provided are um, a pretty good representation of our typical make patient but i chose her because i think that she highlights the success of our integration in our program uh, the first time that we saw her we actually had to send her to the er because her blood sugar was very high she didn't have insulin but she also didn't have a doctor to prescribe it um, so while she was in the er the transitional nurse navigator called me and said you know she, she's here and we had tried to follow her unsuccessfully because we couldn't get in touch with her um, so we coordinated to get her 30 days of all of her medications, which gave me time to find her a primary care physician. Um, and then I went back two days later just to make sure all of her meds were in place and that she was feeling okay. Um, we delivered food from the food pantry. And I also brought a benefits counselor with me that time. Um, she had a Medicare plan that I could not find a provider on this side of the on the Eastern Shore for her. So we changed her back to regular Medicare so that I could get her a doctor. Um, and then we went back a third time and um, helped her get her food stamps and her phone um, and her primary care physician. So now she's being followed regularly. She has a primary care doctor who comes to her home. Um, she has her food stamps. She is able to make calls on her own behalf because now she has a phone. So she's doing very well. Um, our second person, 75-year-old man with limited mobility, the patient's wife, who is his primary caregiver, called 911 many times for crews to assist her with moving him down the steps to the car for appointments. As a result of our visit, a stair lift was installed at no cost to the patient. He was linked to a visiting nurse services from the VA, and his wife uh, was referred for respite care. So prior to our visit, they had called 26 times in the previous five months. Um, because he had appointments that he needed to attend and they have limited <coughs> courses locally. Um, so she couldn't get him outside and felt that her only option was to call 911 two times for every appointment, once to get him out to the car and once to get him back in the house. Um, so we had to think outside the box a little bit for this one and I coordinated with a local company who um, installed a stair lift within a week that the health <coughs> department funded and they have not had to call since. Um, and the third one is an 88-year-old woman who was recently discharged from the hospital with a full cardiac workup. During the visit, the, blood, the patient's blood pressure was found to be dangerously high despite the patient lacking any symptoms or complaints. The team was able to talk to the patient into being transported to the hospital where her hypertension was addressed and she was discharged with a prescription to manage it moving forward. So I think she's a good one because when Mick started, the criteria was five 911 calls in a rolling six-month period, but then we um, realized that it's not just the frequent flyers who can benefit from mixed services. Uh, so this lady in particular lives with her family. She has a lot of support. Uh, she's financially stable, was compliant with her meds. On paper, she seemed to have everything in place, and the hospital just referred her because she's new to the area, and they wanted to ensure that she had all the services that Queen Anne's County could offer. But she actually wrote uh, a little note following her visit, so I want to share that because I think it shows the success. 
Uh, she says, kudos to the nurse and paramedic. They were the best. This was the best visit I had by the paramedic and nurse. They both saved my life. My blood pressure was very high, and if I didn't make this appointment, I might not be here today. The two of them were so efficient, and they saved my life. Thank you both for the wonderful treatment. I had to go to the hospital. Very good treatment. So I think she wraps up my success stories best. It's going to make you guys feel good. Yes. And I just want to give you a quick snapshot of uh, the patients that we're seeing. We've, we've had a total of 742 home visits. And the percentage of patients... Is that patients, one year? Uh, that's that's the, um, the totality of the program. Okay. Uh, the percentage of patients over the age of 65 is 75 percent. The average number of comorbidities per patient is six. So we've got a lot of a lot of folks with a lot of comorbidities, a lot of um, a lot of things we're dealing with. Average number of medications per patient, 10. What? Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of people have trouble following uh, the regimen for one medication, let alone 10 different. And a lot of our patients, like I said, are 65 and over and live alone, and they don't have a lot of support. A number of patients living alone, 42%, and the median age of patients is 71. The reduction in ED visits one year post-enrollment to our program was around 21%. Uh, this chart here just shows the reduced hospital utilization, and we used CRISP data. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's a health information exchange. Uh, they have all the data of the patient's hospital visits, uh, EMS visits. And with that data, we were able to, to um, find out that one month after enrollment into MIC, there was a 58% reduction in ED visits. At two months, it was 32%. Six months, 27%. In 12 months, it was uh, 21%. Um, inpatient visits, that's, you know, it's a big deal for the hospitals because, you know, they can get penalized for, you know, a 30-day readmit. So we have a 66% reduction in within the first 30 days, 54% uh, at two months, 41% at six months, and 26% at 12 months. And then the chart to the right just shows the average um, percent change in the cost, the hospital cost, uh, the, to treat the patient. So these, these numbers are pretty big too, 64% at one month, two months, 41%, six months, 25%, and 12 months, 10%. So there's a lot of... Uh, you know, we have the success stories with our patients, but we, um, we're also showing a dramatic reduction in the use of our emergency departments for these patients and our in, inpatient admissions. Captain Smith, uh, do the case managers, when a patient's being discharged from Anne Arundel or Easton or Salisbury, would they contact you and let you know? Because yes. they're the ones doing, right? If they need a home health care nurse, they're going to, the case manager is going to find the home health care nurse, yeah. Bayada or MedStar or whoever. So they'll, they'll do the home health care nurse and get a hold of you? Yep. It's great. Yeah. And oftentimes, I mean, I don't know if you've, if, I hope none of you have been hospitalized. Um, and hello, I'm Sarah Brayson uh, from Luminous Health. I just little seat, seat swap over here. And thank you for, for letting us join you. Um, but patients are, are so sick leaving the hospital. This is long gone are the days where we tune you up fully and send you home. You're going home very sick. Um, and those case managers are scrambling with patients who are uninsured, who mm, are emotionally homeless, may, that's another new term, um, patients who don't have family or friends to help them out and do things for them. Uh, they're, they're very, very sick returning home. And so again, case managers are scrambling to get plans together and are running into huge barriers. Uh, I don't know what the resources are in Queen Anne's County. This has changed. Who can I call? And it's Mick. You, you have to call Mick. You have to, and these individuals live in, their, uh, live in these communities. They know what's available. They work there. Um, and we are, Queen Anne's County is healthier because of this program. Uh, we, as, as um, has been alluded to in this presentation, other counties have taken note of this and have, have spun off their own programs, which uh, are all very highly successful because of what was started here. Um, and, you know, I, we've, we've really reaped the benefits of things happening in Anne Arundel and Prince George's uh, counties as well because of this. So um, I cannot say enough good things about this program. Um, I, I just, uh, to sum it up best, Queen Anne's County is better off, patients are better off because of this program. Well, because of you guys. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The folks sitting at this table, yes. I've heard, not, not recently, but I've heard of 
days uh, where they couldn't get a home health care nurse. And you're, so you're there within it same day or next day? What, it, what is the time frame? Uh, it, it varies, but we usually try to get at least get them scheduled, what would you say, 48 hours after? It's, with, it's within days. And if, if Melanie or Sarah calls and says this one's priority, then we make them priority. Are you dressing changes? Um, we have. Working on that. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that, right? Commissioners, thank you very much. Thank Any you. other questions? For the um, so your funding mechanism, I'm trying to go back to uh, your partners. Um, you, you, you're, this program is funded, you know, obviously with the help of the commissioners. And um, uh, is there grant dollars available that you guys? We're mostly, most of our program is funded by grants. Okay. The, the bulk of it. All right. You guys should take this on the road to other counties and do the same presentation. Yeah, well, we were the first in the state, and uh, like Sarah said, a lot of uh, jurisdictions follow suit. And we've, we've taken them in and we've showed them the roads and kind of helped them set up the programs, and they've all been pretty successful as well. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ciotola gets great praise statewide by other counties for this program. So, Not just me. You're seeing the program. <laughs> and it was good That's to see why him. I felt that it was important. The face for behind the, the curtain. It's very good to, to see him. him. <laughs> yep. So. It's much better than looking at you every month. I know. That's Not right. that we don't enjoy seeing you, but you can bring your we'll friends like you, back next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.